Welcome, everybody. I'm Mira, Resilience and Embodiment Coach, and it's my absolute pleasure today to invite in Nirja Ahuja, who will be speaking to us about Ayurveda, resilience, panchakarma, and I'm sure many, many other things. Nirja Ahuja is a trained consultant, therapist, course facilitator, educator with over 20 years experience delivering holistic health and wellness. In her clinical practice, Nirja consults clients for diet, lifestyle routines, for physical and mental health, and emotional hygiene, and offers a variety of Ayurvedic detoxification and de-stressing treatments, something I think we all need a little bit of in today's day and age. Her online courses have been taken by up to, uh, her online courses have been taken up by students in 135 countries across the world. I'm super excited to chat with her and dive deep into the topic of Ayurveda. Welcome, Nirja. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, I really appreciate your time today. So let's get started with the basics. What is Ayurveda and what drew you to become so passionate about this topic? Okay. Ayurveda is an ancient health system originated in the land which is now India, but it is universal knowledge. It literally translates into science of life. And it talks about the science of life as it applies to human beings. And it is not something that um, somebody had, um, had made this or, but it was, it is by observing nature Mm. It's like it's like Newton saw the falling apple and worked out about gravity. Mm. So it's said that that is how Ayurveda got known by looking at the laws of nature and then working out how they are applicable to human beings. Mm. And what was it that brought that into being? Why was this inquiry happening at that time? Look, it is part of what we call as Vedas. Vedas are about how to merge back into divinity mm. for a human being. And um, we know that uh, physical body can come in the way. You know, you teach yoga or you're teaching meditation. Even if somebody has some physical aches and pains or something, they can't focus fully. Mm. Right. So physical body is coming in the way. So wherever we want to be, we want to remove whatever is going on in the body, which can become obstacle. So that is how the science of life or Ayurveda came into being. And um, it is looking at what are the laws of nature and it is looking at how to remove the obstacles. So the physical health is there and also more importantly, mental, emotional well-being is also there. So we are working at preventative health so that we can go for higher level things as well. So it almost sounds like observing the laws of nature in order to understand where we haven't been living in accord with them, where we've developed blocks, and then using the laws to heal that and remove those blocks so that we're more in harmony with that. Have I understood that correctly? Yes. yes. Not only we do that post factor, but we also can work. Actually, the real benefit will also be if we can work in, uh, on preventative health and that way before we actually go into that pathway, which may create those kind of issues, we can actually work on those so that we can get more out of our life. We can fulfill our potential that is all there in us. So let me ask you that question, Yaja. How has Ayurveda impacted your life? Well, first of all, um, in the physical sense, I used to be a database programmer uh, more than 20 years ago. And um, something that has been an interest to me is looking after health through natural ways. But that wasn't initially my chosen profession. It was something that I needed to do for my life. And... Um, 
then when I had my children, people told me that oh, you'll be running to doctors all the time. And I thought, no, that's not what I want to do. And I want to continue to work on preventative health and look after myself and look after my children. And that was the motivation at that time more than 20 years ago. And um, I would have been just happy to attend some seminars and learn a little bit more. But what can I say that uh, things happened which changed my whole direction of my life and now last 20 years I've been working as a um, as a health consultant as well as course facilitator and I'm still passionate as I was when I started and I'm still in awe even more so the more I experience and the more I see the results on uh, on my students and uh, course participants and patients, I am in awe of what can happen, what is possible, and what people are getting out of it. I love that. Can you share a bit more about that? Because I think that is what's so uh, inviting, isn't it, is to hear these stories and to witness that awe. Is there something that you've been some specific example that you've experienced recently that you would be open to sharing with us? Well, if I start talking about examples, probably I'll get away. So please stop me. <laughs> okay. I'll do my job and keep you in track. <laughs> okay. One of the first ones I would say, I had um, a patient who was given uh, three to six months to live. And... Um, so in her own words, and that was about, I would say about 18, 19 years ago. So we had just kind of started working in this field. And in her words, she was waiting to die because that's what doctors had said. And um, she herself was an ex-nurse, so she knew even more whatever medication was being given and what is going to happen. And um, she, her husband brought uh, her to us and we started do, doing some diet and lifestyle things as well as giving her some panch karma treatments. And uh, I must say that she had more than what I would regularly give, like we typically say, uh, come and have those treatments every six months, but she had every couple of months or six weeks and she had few cycles of that which is what we talk uh, as spring cleaning of uh, mm. body and mind and she was on wheelchair before that and she was not able to do any household thing um because she couldn't get up and if she got up she was walking with a walking stick and I remember telling her telling the story that one day her husband had cleaned the kitchen and and house and she wasn't happy um, as as it was and she got so upset she just got up picked the bucket and put the water and started cleaning and then suddenly realized, oh my God, what has happened? <laughs> what just happened? It may not be a big thing for anybody really cleaning the house or kitchen, but for her, it was so big. And ultimately she folded away her wheelchair and gave it away. She, uh, she stopped using her stick. So all these things happened within... I would say a uh, year, year and a half mm. of, of once she started coming. So that is something amazing that I can still think of. And also think of, there was another client who she had her five day treatments uh, and, and she come back and says, you know what? I cleaned my fridge. Now, again, that's not something <laughs> which may not look um, a huge thing for one person but for her it indicated some inner transformation mm -hmm. that had manifested in her cleaning the fridge and then painting some pots that she did mm -hmm. so um, it is subjective everybody has different experience and different expression but those are the kind of things I see all the time I find myself to be in such a privileged position where I watch these transformations happening in front of my eyes mm. hmm. I'd love that's 
That's really inspiring, really, really inspiring. And a couple of questions came to mind for me. And as you say, everybody's different, right? Everybody's pathway to healing is unique. And um, But I'm wondering, it sounds like the first woman that you spoke about was very committed to the work. Like she really took on, did a lot of um, the Panchakarma spring cleanings, which I want to talk more with you about uh, in a moment. How do you find like, is there a difference in the way that you approach it? So if, is there a kind of, are there obstacles for people who are trying to maybe take on some of this advice when they come to see you? And, and how do you work with people who are maybe having those kind of challenges, really making the changes and doing the things that are needed to have that kind of transformation? Uh, look, the, uh, the person, again, going back to her, I think some of the commitment came out of necessity for her because she was already given time frame. Mm. And uh, initially, more than her, it was her husband who was committed until she took it on because in her words, she was just waiting mm. for the eventual things to happen because she had given up. And uh, so... Um, but it works even if you are not having the same level of commitment. Mm. Uh, I have seen it shifting in people. But it is like whether uh, as long as you are doing spring cleaning, yes, your commitment will make it that you will go into um, nooks and crannies where you won't have gone if you were unwilling. But spring cleaning will still work mm. to some extent. So it may work for somebody more, somebody less, but who am I to say what would have been? I just work with what is there mm. and I have seen shifting. Mm. As long as people come, they lie down on the table, they get the treatments, things happen. And that's what amazes me. Things happen and deep things can happen too. Mm. So what would you say, like a lot of the people I speak with, you know, there's, I think, you know, when you and I talked prior to today and Ayurveda definitely addresses this directly from what I understand, I'd love to hear more from you about body, mind connection and being one. But a lot of what I, I know people are re is top of mind for people, especially after the two years of shutdown and COVID are things like, depression, anxiety, sense of isolation, like you were speaking about earlier, there's a real emphasis on mental health, emotional well-being. And how does Ayurveda address this directly? Look, we say that we exist at different levels, mind, body, senses, and the soul. And even as a medical system, it's an ancient medical system, as a medical system, it talked about soul. And from Ayurvedic perspective, mind is the real driver. For, and, but it is wanting us to go towards in the direction of soul. If I can say it very simplistically. Mm. And a lot of times it is our mind, you know, uh, which is not following what we need, we, somewhere we know we need to do. For example, we all know how to have good relationships, but still when we are arguing or fighting or, you know, with somebody, I have heard from lots of people inside their head, they already know this is not right. This is going to get them into further trouble, right? But the mind is, uh, so the, at some level, we know what is right, mm. but we are still not able to follow. So from Ayurvedic perspective, we still call it as uh, toxins in a very generic mm. sense of word. That's so, and that because it's something external, it can be removed. Mm. So we use the tools and techniques like diet, lifestyle, um, and herbs and treatments. All these are tools and techniques that are available um, so that we can remove those toxins. So then what is left is that uh, somebody who is, um, who is more connected with that light within. Mm. It reminds me... Um... 
you know, I come through the embodiment yoga tools, like regulating the nervous system and this sense of once that is calmed, there is access to that deep wisdom that also is connected to the body, lives within the body as well, lives within the soul, lives within the mind. It's all connected and it's getting those kind of chaotic or, you know, your toxic thoughts or toxic physical experiences or toxic emotions, finding yes. that release to yes. allow what's already naturally inherently there to have the capacity yes. to be expressed. Exactly. And let me give you another example. Everything that we are taking, talking about diet and lifestyle, we are not really for uh, talking about, for example, when we are talking about diet, we're not saying how many proteins and vitamins and minerals. They are there good for the physical being, but we look at what does this food do to my mind? Mm. If it brings calm and peace and equanimity, it is good food. But if it brings agitation to the mind, it is, uh, well, that's not necessarily support, going to support me in long term. Mm -hmm. Or foods can be um, that can bring dullness to the mind, right? So we are not looking at uh, the physical aspects, but we are looking at what does it do to my mind? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you would have had the experience of music. If you listen to meditation music, it will have a different effect even on the body as well as mind, mm -hmm. right? Compared to dancing music or heavy metal. So the effect is on the overall being is different. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, even that is the food taken in through our senses. Mm. And we need to look at, is it, what kind of effect it is bringing? Is it something desirable or undesirable? And then look at uh, choosing appropriate diet, mm. whether it is physical food or the kind of music, the kind of conversations, the kind of um, sensory input. We will look at all of them. Very holistic, yes, and how it affects. It reminds me um, the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh and when you take the precepts in his tradition and um, let me see if I can remember it correctly, when, you know, people like, oh, don't eat meat, but he's like, I don't, cons oh, no, don't take intoxicants. And he's like, trashy TV, crappy magazines, crappy food. <laughs> he's like across the board. And like you said, you know, toxic thoughts. This is going to be coming in from all sorts of directions. And then interestingly, the food as medicine concept that you were just exploring then, and not just physically, but how is it affecting you emotionally? And I was um, listening to a story, a similar thing. Someone just, um, one of my teachers, her son was having really disruptive behaviours at school and really socially anxious and all these things. And then they did find that his body and his mind didn't respond well to gluten. And they were able to eliminate that from the diet. And a huge different was, difference was made to his emotional and, and mental health just as a result of exploring that person. Yes. Yeah. yes, and a lot of uh, ancient um, systems or thought processes or philosophies are aware of that and present to that, I must say. And, uh, well, I am a little bit biased towards Ayurveda. <laughs> yes. Tell me what you think but, distinguishes uh, Ayurveda specifically. I wanted to ask you that question. Why is it so, you know, what, what makes it stand out for you? Well, uh, you know, there are many ways of reaching the mountain, but whatever you have taken, you have to continue to go there. That's the only way you will reach. If you say halfway through, no, this is too hard. Let me try another way. And then that is too hard. And let me try another way. Mm -hmm. You may not reach. So you cannot uh, get water by digging one foot in 50 places. You have to dig one place, 50 feet down, then there is more possibility. So I'm, um, I, I love reading and I, uh, and I, you know, um, see and read other ways 
of looking and understanding and it is and there's always uh, there to learn but i am saying that to me somehow that's where i have landed this is the direction that is something that i have taken and i have ended up exploring it a lot more than many other things mm -hmm. like uh, when people ask me what's the comparison between Chinese and medicine and Indian well I don't know Chinese medicine as well as I know Ayurveda I cannot really give a good comparison <laughs> only thing I know is whatever I know mm. so uh, I've been doing this for so many years I grew up coming from Indian background I kind of knew a little bit about so my whole life has been geared towards this so that's all i can say but i know and i said i've and it has got ayurveda itself has got a history of that written texts are said to be about six thousand years old oral form it has been said to be there for forty thousand years so anything that lasts that long has to be robust it would have given results mm. it is not that one day we learn butter is good and then we learn margarine is good and then learn butter is good again um things are, are changing things are uh, we are learning but this has been around for so long obviously it has been giving results mm. solid foundations i wanted to ask you specifically nirja about resilience so we were talking about this in our chat offline as well. And it's a very, mm, I don't want to say popular, but needed conversation in today's world where people are finding that sense of hopelessness in the face of what's going on, maybe inside themselves, around themselves. How would you see Ayurveda? How would you see resilience through the Ayurvedic lens? Well, it is, we are talking about mental, emotional health here as well because innate in resilience is that i will fall because that's the only way we will learn resilience is we fail in inverted commas we fail and then we get up mm. and then we fail and then we get up not just as a one thing but we may fail many times but we get up so it is what i it is also connected with what i think about me it is connected with my self-esteem mm. so it is the more i am connected with the soul aspect of me mm. the more i can see the light in me and i like to give the analogy of if i can see i am wave of the same ocean then i will learn to be okay that because this is the process of life you know and it is an inbuilt process in us when you look at a child who's just learning to walk how many times the child falls down and then every time instead of making it mean something how horrible they are or how um, inadequate they are they just get up and walk again Mm. So that resilience is actually at some level is given to us, is we come with, but mm. somehow along the way we have forgotten. I want to ask about that concept of reset and resilience. So that falling down, that failing, and then the capacity to get back up. And sometimes in, in some of the things I teach, that's about, okay, it's your reset. You've stopped doing the things, whatever they were, that's fine. It's just like, all right, let's reset and start again. And that's the, the capacity to be resilient is to embody that and to do that. Would you say, this is just a thought that I had based on our last conversation, is the process of detoxification as it is in Ayurveda, could that be seen as a similar thing? Is that like a reset? Absolutely, absolutely. Because some things we cannot just go by logic and understand because understanding in the head is different from understanding of the body, understanding in our being, right? So there are things which are beyond just the mind can comprehend. Mm. 
-hmm. And that is probably um, as a meditation and yoga teacher, you might have seen that, but I see it all the time. Um, when we do things like diet and lifestyle and panchakarma kind of things which are spring cleaning well patient just lies down on the table and they are having their full body massage and whatever other protocols are there but they wake up from the table feeling different mm -hmm. they didn't have to analyze and then leave it consciously because when these things are stored in the body whether it is trauma or or we are working on resilience or we are working on getting rid of the emotional things we not only have to work with the logic but we also have to work on memories we have to work on energy so i find that ayurveda has given us tools um including panchakarma but there are other things that we do and uh, that they don't have to just rely on one aspect of understanding through the through the logic or through the head so to speak let's talk more about the panchakarma because i was curious about this in terms of the, the reset you know really understanding that we are going to fail we are going to get sick we at times we are going to have struggles and that there is this capacity to almost an invitation in that moment to even go deeper into that learning into that process of releasing more this is kind mm -hmm. of how i understand it and the detoxification so mm -hmm. could you tell us a bit more what happens in a panchakarma and and how that operates that release okay so panchakarma is uh, what i like to describe as a spring cleaning and just like when we are doing the house, uh, cleaning the house, spring cleaning has got one place. It doesn't mean that we are not doing everyday cleaning, but, but spring cleaning is just one of those things. And Ayurveda says do it every change of season, but we recommend practically every uh, six months if you can do it, even if you don't have any disease, but you want to get more out of your life. You want to get rid of those hidden emotional toxins, for example, or things that may become issue 20 years down the lane, but right now you're managing. So typical ones, the most common one that we give is uh, five days, we do more than five days as well, longer ones as well. And people, uh, it starts with a consult where we look at what is going on and set up a protocol. And then during that time, people are taking maybe specific herbal support, which we um, talk to them and it depends on what is needed. They may be taking simplest of diet and we give some recommendations around that as well, because it's like when you are doing spring cleaning a house, you don't throw a big party. So you want to keep food also very simple. Then during that time, people may be there for about three hours a day. Um, get, they are on the table, starting typically with full body massage. There might be some herbal steam on spine, shoulders, lower back, the areas where we are storing a lot of tensions and stresses and traumas. And then they, there are uh, there may be a treatment. Uh, the one that we give a lot is typically on the lower back also. We uh, give a treatment because that's almost there as an emotional storage place mm -hmm. so we work on that and then another one that we can give is where a, more than a liter of oil is poured over the forehead and that works on getting rid of all the stresses and the emotional stuff from here as well it is very good for sleep mm -hmm. and i do hear a lot of snoring in my room but we just take it as <laughs> compliment <laughs> so that is what happens for five days. And I don't know what people are storing. People may initially, it's like when you start spring cleaning the house, initially it may look more dirty until it gets cleaned up. So first couple of days, people may feel maybe more tired if they have been working on top of their tiredness. Uh, I don't know what they are storing, so I can't say. And sometimes nothing may happen. They just wake up from the table feeling different five days of that and we have removed enough toxins from the deeper tissue and brought them out, uh, out to the GI tract. So we get rid of that through some kind of 
herbs so that uh, it goes out of the system. And then we finish with the follow-up because whatever we may say, body doesn't know about your time and money. Mm. It is at the place wherever it is, but we want to make sure that you are on solid ground, that you know what uh, what is next. And also it might be time to send some goodies, some, some good things, good herbs, because the absorption gets better after the whole process, mm -hmm. because we have got rid of some of the toxins. So absorption is good. It is also time to send some goodies in. So we do some rejuvenating kind of herbs and, and we talk to them about what to do next at home to get more advantage. So that's the, in short, that's the process. So let's talk finally just a little bit about that. I loved your metaphor. I'm going to steal it from you and tell it and then ask you a question. But you talked yeah. about the panchakarma as the spring cleaning. Yes. And you use the metaphor. You're like, all of it is necessary. The daily cleaning is necessary. The weekly, slightly bigger clean. And then the spring clean, all of that for that overall balance. So I loved that when you told me that story and that metaphor. Hmm. What is it like to then do your... So once you've done a panchakarma and you've got this beautiful absorption going on, which is going to support, as we've discussed, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual well-being more effectively, how would one, what is the daily cleaning look like? What does the daily kind of maintenance look like once okay. people have okay. completed? Okay. So there are plenty of things. We can uh, find that uh, right, right, appropriate diet can help then um, so that will mean that we are creating less physical toxins that we might have generated if we were taking a lot of um, inappropriate foods or in if I can simplify and say factory foods versus um, farm foods even if farming is you know, we can, it is better to get organic foods, for example. But I find other than the physical hygiene, it's the mental hygiene. You know, we have learned about dental hygiene, but it's mental hygiene also. Mm -hmm. So I find um, that meditation, for example, could be a practice for somebody. Going out in the nature can be a walk in the nature could be for somebody else. It is uh, subjective again. And when we are working with patients, we see what is most appropriate. But these are two very common things, appropriate diet and something in the lifestyle mm. to, to bring that energy back or anchoring us in the right place for us, where um, I am not distracted by the things that don't support me. So mm -hmm. anchoring myself every day in the place of power for me. Mm, beautifully said. I could talk to you for ages, Nirja, and your amazing wisdom. Thank you for sharing you. so much of it with us. If people are interested in learning more about you, about learning more about Panchakarma about learning more about Ayurveda in general, where would they get information from you to start learning a little bit more? Well, we have a website um, so they can go there or connect us through email. So website is www.ayurveda-awareness.com.au or they can connect through telephone 08 or email us on info at ayurveda-awareness.com.au. I hope uh, I don't have to spell out the name of Ayurveda or should I? I'm going to put all the links in okay. any way. So yeah, okay. we just yeah. Let, let you mention yeah. them and then I'll put them uh, texted in text yeah. for people to click on and right. visit. Yes. Yeah, so People can come for a consult, people can come for a one-off uh, treatment or massage or what we call a stress buster to our program where we do massage and uh, steam or they can book for the panchakarma, mm. um, whatever way, or they can actually even come and do some courses with us as well, which we run online live and learn through that uh, more if they want to. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nirja. I really appreciate the time that you've taken today and sharing your beautiful wisdom with us. Thank you very much for having me. And I really enjoy talking to you. Likewise. Yeah. Bye.